everyone, and welcome back to the Let's Process That podcast. I'm Emily Christopher. And I'm Nick Connorcamp. And we are so glad that you have joined us once again. And it is our delight to pick yet another listener requested topic. And we're going to dive right in. Um, I'm going to toss it to Nick and we're going to get to the nitty gritty. We're going to get down on this one because this one has definitely been brought up multiple times. Um, some people with very specific questions about it. Some people who are just now navigating this area of their life and have a lot of questions and a lot of people who feel like they are stuck. So we're going to go ahead and address it. So Nick, I'm going to toss it to you and we will get this party started. All right. So we're, we didn't set out to do any kind of podcast that was directed or focused on family stuff. But however, it's, this stuff keeps coming up. We talk about relationships. We talk about boundaries. We talk about new seasons of life. And somehow or another, people send us emails and going, we need you to talk about what to do with your family. And so once again, something similar. And this is, uh, these are some comments that came up about how do you deal with generational issues that's been in your family? How do, the difference between nature and nurture? And, and so we sort of called this one nature, nurture, and nowadays. So you've got the the you were born with a DNA, you were born with a color of skin, with with a um, a gender, you were born with characteristics, proclivity. To, some people were born with a proclivity towards drug and alcohol. Some people have a proclivity towards obesity or cancer or diabetes or something like that. So there definitely there is a nature piece to all this, and I'll circle back to that at some point. But then there's this nurture piece, and the nurture piece is, I, I, this is the, my best quote on the nurture piece, M. It is, good parents can raise bad kids. Bad parents can raise good kids. But weird parents always raise weird kids. I mean, oh that's God. just the fact of it. <laughs> Weird Yay, parents weird always. Kids. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. If you know, you know. So, and then you've got nowadays. And nowadays is that season where nature and nurture have done their best to you. They have, they've given you whatever they've given you. And how many of those expectations are you living under now as an adult in nowadays? And it's like, why do you? cut the meatloaf like that and then you realize your mom did it for 30 years and nurture has left its imprint on you or whatever and so people are asking like you know adult people are like i don't understand why i'm still hung up with this or why my parents were like this my grandparents are like this i'm like that can you can you all process this and just talk a little bit and um and so just just real quick let me set this up one more way when we had a grandbaby I made this little thing up where it, it seems to me that when you have a grandbaby, a portion of that baby comes from the father, a portion comes from the mother, a portion comes from some generational person, and then a portion has never been used before in mankind. It's brand new. Because you'll see a child that is way more like their father than like their mother mm -hmm. or vice versa. Um, but also you'll see this blonde headed kid and this brunette family are like, where'd you get your blonde hair? Well, my uncle, you know, had the, so mom has a piece, dad has a piece, uh, the generations have a piece. And then there's a piece that's just brand new that's never been used before. And I say that because, um, it's very common. You'll see a short family and all of a sudden you'll have, have a real tall son and they're like, where'd that kid come from? And they're like, well, my grandfather was six foot three and, and they'll tell that story. So nature is real. Nurture is real, obviously. Nurture, I think, is stronger than nature, what we were taught as kids in our formative years. But then there's nowadays. There's this third piece where we actually get a choice if we will take it. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked how many of us as adults are afraid to disappoint our parents, are afraid to break the norm, are afraid to just do what brings us joy and happiness because of social norms or expectations people have on us. So when we got all these requests, you and I said, okay, we're not even going to talk about it until we get on camera, but let's go ahead and hit this and let's roll around for a while. So that's the setup. M, what do you think about some of what I just said? Well, there's a lot there. I will say that. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. 
So I think it's fascinating to really examine the nature versus nurture thing. And I'm sure there is a ton of psychology. I've done a little bit of studying of it years ago, but there really is a ton of stuff out there on this. And it is very fascinating. And there's all kinds of different sides, different perspectives, different studies. But then there's some things like we just can't escape. Like Mm -hmm. what's fascinating is when um, I know a lot of people will tell me I'm so much like my grandmother on my dad's side. And she passed away when I was 16. I was very close to her. But for over half my life, she's not been in the picture. You know, she's not had her influence on me. But our personalities and the way that we take care of people, some of our life journey has been very similar. Um, So it's been interesting being compared to someone that we only had so many years together, right? Um, Right. And it's interesting, too, to see how much of that is just like DNA ingrained, like personality that I was born with. Um, And then, of course, the nurture side of it, where um, we are taught so much on how to respond to things, how to make decisions, um, how to settle arguments, like all these different things that most likely you have walked in, in into adulthood from what you were taught in your childhood and by your right. family dynamic. And so it's fascinating to come to the age. And I know I say come to the age, but that could be at 21. That could be at 41, 71, et cetera. <laughs> and realize weird. that, and, and I know there's there was a woman I um, was in a growth group with who was in her 70s. And she was like, I am just now breaking like, generational curses and childhood traumas off my life. So it doesn't matter what age you are. When you begin to realize um, how positively and negatively the influence of family and generational influences, even of like uncles and aunts, grandparents, et cetera, were on your life and how much that has shaped you, it is shocking. Yeah, completely. And, And it's one of those things where you have to really step back and start questioning things. And it's really hard if you grew up in a very authoritative family and you were told not to question things. Um, And now it's like, okay, well, now I'm an adult and I need to start examining some of this. So I'm curious. Well, well, I want to say this. uh, And we, who knows, we may get into it on this. You have one of the most fascinating upbringings and childhood journeys of anyone I ever knew. Like when I heard your life story from like birth through probably your mid 20s, I was like, what? That is the most interesting thing. And so I'm really, really, really curious your input on all this because I had a stereotypical upbringing childhood of like a nuclear family. My parents were married and are still married. I have two siblings, like very American westernized kind of the white picket fence thing. But you, sir, had a lot of different nature and nurture nurture, um, components. So I feel like you are definitely someone to speak to this for sure. (laughs) Okay. So you did this to me on the last episode, threw me a grenade. I didn't see it coming and (laughs) got me into trouble. I'm sure when the podcast comes out, because you knew it was a trigger of mine and I was going to bite (laughs) on it. Uh, I'm not biting on this one. I will say this. I I think there's plenty we can talk about Mm -hmm. about that in a separate podcast. And I'd Mm. love to talk about it. I just need to prepare a little bit for it to protect everybody. So if you'll absolutely, but I I can speak to this very, very much so. Two two things I want to mention to you real quick. First of all, is I knew I knew a girl who was adopted at one year old. Her mom uh, gave her up for adoption at one. Her mom moved far, far away. Um, Her mom has some very specific dysfunctions. I mean, you could document, you know, five to 10 dysfunctions on this chart. And so her mom moves away. The baby gets adopted by another family. I have the privilege of watching that young lady grow up and check every one of her mama's boxes and yet had never met her since she was one year old. 
she did all the same bad characteristics. She mirrored her mother. And yet her mother was only a part of her life for one year. And I saw the power of generational stuff happening right there that nature passes on. And we can get to that in a minute, have a little spiritual pit stop and talk about, you know, what a generational curse looks like that you just alluded to. The second thing, though, that I find fascinating is is Tiger Wood. And I don't beat up on celebrities because we all have our stuff. But Tiger Wood is just chugging along as the greatest golfer of all time, most beloved golfer of all time, and his father dies. When Earl Woods died, Tiger Tiger went semi crazy for a while. Mm -hmm. And he and everybody watched publicly all the stuff Tiger got into because the one man he wanted to please wasn't here anymore. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he threw off restraints. No judgment from me, no shade from me whatsoever. Hate that he went through that. Hate that his family went through that. Hate that all of that happened. But it was fascinating watching someone who held it together meticulously for years and created the career, the family, everything. His father dies, his role model, and mm-hmm. suddenly he, he just loses all restraint. And, and it looks like he's gaining that back. But that's, a, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. What about the nowadays when nature and nurture has done its work? You know, we're adults now. Can we make some choices and decisions and mom and dad be upset with us and it's okay? So Mm -hmm. respond to that, please, ma'am. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about Tiger Woods, I immediately thought of Kanye West. Um, I've always been a fan of Kanye from the very beginning of his career. Um, And if you follow his career, it's a very similar thing. Like when his mother passed away, there was this huge dynamic shift in everything he did his like his creativity there was like differences in his music uh things with his personality you could tell that that shifted him in just the biggest way and um you know i'm even thinking of of friends who um really live under the influence of their parents and how you know, wanting to please them, there's like a healthy wanting to please your parents. And then I think there's also um, a very negative one that it's almost like a codependent relationship um, where the rise and fall of who you are hinges on them and their approval. And it will either make or break you. And um, I, we grew up in a sports household. And so I got to see this firsthand with a bunch of like middle school boys, especially when my brother was playing travel baseball and how these parents actually thought their children were, you know, for sure going to be number one draft pick. Um, and they like watching these 12, 11, 12 year old boys killing themselves um, to please a father or a mother. and just watching how um, the criticism they received um, just or the praise that they received, how it was shaping who they are and how hard or not hard they would work at something. And it's crazy that at that young, um, your work ethic is being set, your motives, like why are you doing this? For what reason are yeah. being laid before you? And um, sometimes it's really inspiring when it's healthy, and then other times it is so sad to watch that happen, especially to kids. Absolutely. So that's, you know, nurture, I think, is more powerful than nature. But going back to my childhood a little bit, Emily, this I'm not going to tell the whole story today, but I'll tell just a short piece. What's fascinating is I was asked in a counseling um, a counseling situation what my first childhood toy was. I didn't remember. And, but then the, the very first one I could remember was the little army soldiers. So they had the little green and gray army soldiers. And they would, you know, we would put them up and set them up and pretend like they were at war with everyone. Well, the green were Americans. The gray were the hated Germans. This is like World War II, right? Mm-hmm. So I always played with the gray ones. And my favorite color became gray. I grew up in a family that I thought was my biological family that wasn't. And I found out when I was 11, I'm of German descent. And I'm sitting here going, as a kid, I'm playing as the German soldier. 
when no Americans playing what they want to play with the German soldiers, they are American. They want to play with the green ones. Something in my DNA said gray should be your favorite color. You should, you know, you play with the Germans. And then I find out later that my real family is of, of German heritage. And I'm like, that's nature. It just, it's at work. It's this force in the background that's working with you, uh, with you or against you. The thing that I found, and, and I see that, and I think a lot of people are, are, are behaving sometimes from forces they're not really, that they don't understand or really see. But mm -hmm. what happens when you do see it? What happens when you're an adult? Mm -hmm. And what if your parents have money and in order to get that money, to help buy a car, to help buy a house, you have to vote a certain way or behave a certain way or have mm -hmm. certain values. Why is it so hard for us as adults to disappoint our parents? Yeah. What is that? Well, and it's also like growing up and finding out the truth about some things. It's like, I'm that sure helps. as a <laughs> I'm also sure like as a child, if you knew like, all of what Germany represented, you'd be like, I don't want to be this. Oh my gosh. Great this point. Is, yeah, you were like, um, no, this is not the team I want to be on. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, <laughs> there was a grandparent of mine who um I had gone <laughs> this was in college. Um, this was uh right when I went to off to college freshman year, I went around to like the clubs. Um, all the different clubs they had on campus, just like it was like a fair, like to see if you wanted to be in any of these college clubs. And I remember um, college Republicans were giving uh, beer bottle openers out, which is also just really funny at um, a Christian university where we were a dry <laughs> campus. Well, I at the time, I, um, well, I've never been a Republican, but anyways, um, and, but I had it on my keychain cause I remember I needed a bottle opener. I was in college <laughs> and, um, my grandfather, um, on my mom's side saw the keychain and he was like, that's what I want to see. Here's a $50 bill. And like, it's just so funny. I was like, well, jokes on you. I'm opening a beer with this strictly for its purposes, but thank you for the 50 bucks. But it was funny. When you do, I don't know, there's this expectation on you and then you're rewarded. And then what happens when you grow up and you're like, this is not part of who I want to be or whatever. And again, no hate, no shade. I'm not making this about politics. Um, if you know me, you know, I'm like, Bleh. politics are nasty. The government's corrupt. Anyways, um, but it is wild how influences shift and how people in our life will also, and especially in our family, like reward if we agree with them. And then if we yeah. disagree, you get cut off. Because mm -hmm. um, like you were saying, there's families that like, if you disagree with them, religious wise, politically, ideologies of any kind, or you don't, I have a friend who didn't go into the career that his parents wanted and they cut him off. They were like, wow. you were supposed to be a doctor. You don't want to be a doctor. That's it. Wow. And so it's just wild what, and, and I know we've said this before, because even um, a couple of podcasts ago, somebody was talking about this and it's sad that we're willing to break family, family, because we disagree with something so small. Um, but the punishment and reward system in a lot of families is wild to sit back and observe. And what okay. families will support and what they will tear down. So I, I've got a view that I want to share with you. And this is probably not universal. Just because one person of experience doesn't mean everybody that looks like that person, acts like that person, has the same experience. So let's not go there. But I was talking to a pastor this last week who has an adult child. And the adult child lives with him and does not have the same values around religion. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, is that difficult? How hard is that, that you are a pastor, have strong religious views, you have an adult child that lives in your house that has different values and views, and he says, I choose relationship. I choose relationship over anything. He can disagree with me on politics, religion, anything. Does it disappoint me from time to time? Sure. But I choose relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm... 
but I know families like what you just said, they cut him off. They mm-hmm. valued values and expectations over relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes because the parents are the power brokers, if they intimate that they will cut off relationship, if they intimate that you'll be the black sheep or not be invited to Christmas, um, I can see how from a very early age that people pleasing or at least parent pleasing becomes important in their life. And I would just say that if someone's an adult and they're frustrated with how much of their soul they're giving away to pretend to be something they're not, maybe it's time to have that conversation. Just sit them down and say, Mm -hmm. I love you more than anything in the world. And I can't imagine, can imagine a situation, conversation where we would break relationship and Mm -hmm. let their parents say, well, of course, there's no Mm -hmm. no way we'd break. And then bring the big one on them and say, well, good, because I want to talk to you about this. And I don't know, just it may be something because we got to get free somehow. The only other way I know to get free is we watch our parents fail in some area and we finally get the courage and see behind the curtain that they're not perfect. And, you know, they never were perfect. But Mm -hmm. in our eyes, they were perfect. And like what you said about Germany. Sometimes we have to see it in our parents and say, okay, they're not perfect. So I, I have the right to have my own opinion, not be perfect too. Mm-hmm. One of the most freeing things for me, um, and you just think bringing this up makes me so emotional. My parents years ago shared something. They like set us down and like talked to us kids. And they were like, we really want to like be vulnerable with you guys. And um, we want to have a family conversation. And it was just this beautiful moment where, like, my parents really were talking about, like, their own struggles. And um, I had never seen just how real and raw my parents were. And it was the most freeing thing for all of us. Not just them. Wow. But for us. And we were all adults, like, my siblings and I at the time. And they just, we had this really candid conversation. and. I don't think they'll ever know how that freed us up because in my eyes, like up until that point, like I, I, and I still do hold my parents at such high regard and look at them as like nearly perfect, even though I know they're not, but like, I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are just so great. Like, especially my dad, like he is so full of integrity and I'm just, how could I ever be as good as you, your heart? And your motives and your decisions are so good. And then for someone to be like, hey, like you're saying, behind the veil, let me show you that it's uh, this is my struggle. This is really hard for me and I'm not perfect. And if we could even have more vulnerability, I know that's something mm-hmm. we talk about a lot, but if we could be more vulnerable with each other and not afraid to show the scars, the disappointments, yeah. the failures. Um, it would, it would free up so many of us, not just as kids, but also the parent, um, if we were able to just be real and honest about things that we've experienced or the pain that we go through. Yeah. Great. Well said. And your dad, mom are, they're rocks. I mean, they really are. Nobody's perfect. And I'm glad they at least shared with their siblings where they're not perfect. The rest of us still think they're perfect. So there you go. (laughs) Um, this reminds me of a funeral I was just at on Saturday. Um, you, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Some folks from, from out of town came in and I looked at them and said, this is going to be a mountain funeral. This is straight up mountain all day long. And, um, the preacher was an older guy and he stood up and said, he was speaking to the family about this gentleman that just passed away. And he said, uh, I've known five generations of this family. He says, for five generations, they've lived in this valley. And he looked at my friend, who's an adult male, said, I knew your great-granddaddy. I knew your granddaddy. I knew your daddy. I know you. I know your kids. And they just eulogized the whole bloodline. And when my friend got up to speak, he said, all I want to do is live up to the shadow of my grandfather and live up to the reputation of my daddy. That, I mean, that's what I want because I respect and hold them in high regard. And the next man that got up to speak said, son, there's only one thing separating you from being like your daddy and your granddaddy. It's called time. Just keep doing what you're doing over a long enough time. 
and you'll be that. Well, that's a heavy load to carry. Now, Mm -hmm. I believe in this guy, and if anybody can do it, he can do it. But I'm sitting here going, nature has passed down, nurture has passed down a reputation to this guy that a lot of people don't have. A lot of people, you know, maybe their parents divorced and they don't have to please either one of them. Maybe they moved around a lot. Maybe they don't know who their grandfather was. Mm-hmm. This dude's got five generations in one valley that, that, that people know who he is. They know where he comes from, that he reminds himself of a re- on a regular basis. And in one way, that's a blessing. But mm-hmm. In another way, that's a curse, right? Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And as somebody who, I mean, I think we can trace my dad's side of the family, like the Christophers, like. Yep. I mean, probably like early 1800s in Mm -hmm. the mountains of North Carolina. And so, yeah, when there's this expectation put on you, um, I mean, it was even like my dad's side of the family are farmers and they've owned farms for now hundreds of years. And it was like, all right, who's going to be a farmer? And it's like, none of us want to be farmers. Not that, you know, that's not a noble and amazing job and career, but that's just not what we were destined to do or desired to do. And so, you know, it's it's interesting to feel the way of who's going to carry on the family business. And I have a friend right now who's in that same situation where he wants to go out in the world and explore and do new things and start his family in a new city. And he's like, but my dad's business. Mm. Mm. Well, I can't, I can't do anything. Like I'm, Am I stuck? Is this my forever? I can't let my dad down. And so that's heavy and that's really hard. That's the man. That's terrible. Well, and I I mentioned in one of our podcasts, my dad was a pastor. I was a pastor. When I stepped down, my son, my, when I was a pastor, my sons were like, which one of us has to be a pastor? (laughs) We neither one of us want to be, but somebody has got to be. And, and I was like, who told you that? Who, who put that expectation on you? But there's something in us that's innate to please our parents Mm -hmm. and um, unless they violated us or done something horrible and then we get to demonize them and, you know, go the other direction. But yeah, the Christopher farms are well known and there's nothing wrong with not wanting to be a farmer at all, but it's hard to break the expectations that are set on us from one thing or another. And that's what a lot of the people that were reaching out to us were, they were like, how do we honor our parents? How mm-hmm. do we honor the heritage? Mm-hmm. Like the guy you're talking about. His father has a success, successful business, but he doesn't want to be that. How mm-hmm. do we show honor to him that you're not looking down on what he's providing for you? You're just not built for that. You, mm-hmm. you want to go do something else with your life. And I think it's a real hard thing. And I think that a lot of adults, particularly in their 30s and 40s, really struggle and really deal with that. And and then you've got generational curses on top of that. But but who's got the guts to go and have a hard conversation with their parents or openly come out and just say, I'm not going to vote like they vote. I don't believe like they believe. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's hard stuff right there. Mm-hmm. That takes so much courage. Mm-hmm. And it is terrifying. Like, it is. It took me a long time to tell my parents that, well, not my parents. I told my mom pretty quickly, but to tell my dad that I wanted to move away. Yeah. Like it terrified me to tell him that. Um, And he had some pushback. He had a lot of questions. um, Sure. But at the end of the day, gave his blessing. And um, this makes me emotional. Like it was the most beautiful thing as I was leaving. um, Had like the car loaded up like this classic movie scene. And I'm about to pull away from their house. And he said, you'll always have somewhere to come home to. No matter what, we are here. And if this is a hot mess, if this is um, not what you thought it was going to be, if you're miserable, you can always come home. And I was, and that was, I'm 30 years old. And he's saying this to me. Um, And I know, you know, my dad loves all his kids and we all live literally across the world. Um, Mm -hmm. And for him to 
be like, this isn't what I would want. He would love all his children to live on his land and have houses and raise babies on the property. Um, But he gave his blessing and still, you know, signed off and told me there's a place to come. But Man, leading up to that point, I was terrified. Like I really, really was. It was it was so hard for me to have that conversation with him. <sighs> yeah, because you respect him so much and yeah. you really do want to have a relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And you've made a couple decisions that I mm-hmm. know disappointed him. Yeah. And so what gave you the grace and the guts to do that? Was it your trust in him and in a relationship? Was it a pain that you just had to go do it anyway? What what was it that, that allowed you to be able to do that? I loved myself more. Wow. And let me not say not more than my dad. I'm not saying that. But I loved myself and knew I was worthy to go chase a dream. And I had to get the courage to say, I am choosing me. I, I have to live with me for the rest of my life. I have to live with the consequences of every action I take, whether that's a good consequence or a bad consequence. And so I love me and I choose me. And I also trust my, the spirit that's inside of me. I trust um, the process. And so I'm going to say yes to this. And if I fail, I fail. But I'm choosing myself because for so long I chose other people and it was to my detriment. So this time I'm like, you always say this, Emily bets on herself. I was really like, I'm going to bet all my chips are going in and I'm going to do it. So, and we've reached a real dilemma in the show. Um, There's no way I could have ever guessed that we would figure out one of the keys to disappointing our parents and other people we hold in high regard. And, but we did, you just did, to bet on yourself, to believe in yourself, to love yourself and choose yourself. You are not created to be a duplicate of your parents. Mm -hmm. You were the byproduct of your parents created to do something beautiful and wonderful all to yourself. So somehow you were able to articulate that and give our viewers hope that this is how you do it. You go up to your mom and say, I love you, but I'm not going to do this anymore because I love me. Imagine mm-hmm. that. I now love me and I know what I want to be and what I want to do. And I'm doing this not to irritate you or despite you. I'm doing mm-hmm. this because I believe in me. Mm-hmm. The problem is, though, we've done that. But the flip side is most people don't have that. Right. Who loves himself? Enough mm-hmm. to make hard decisions. Who believes in himself enough to maybe risk a relationship with somebody they highly respect and have a ton of appreciation for? And that's the dilemma that, we, that we're in right now is while that at least is clarified, gosh, mm-hmm. it's so hard to do. Yeah. And, and let me clarify one thing. When I said, like, I love me more, I love me more than the fear of disappointment from uh, my parents. Um, because that you, you have to get over that because you will disappoint. So there will be disappointment somewhere. So either you're going to have to live with that disappointment wow. and make peace with that, or you're going to have to, like you said, I love you, but I need you to love me enough to go out or to, or to disagree with me or to allow me to explore and discover new things. and. It's not, it's not been this beautiful cookie cutter thing. Like I said, me and my dad have went round and round on a lot of stuff. We're both very headstrong. um, And there is plenty of things that we disagree on very, very much so. Um, But at the end of the day, I know, and I'm thankful that we will love each other no matter what. Um, You know, you remove everything else and I am loved. And I hope that for everybody, because I know that's not the case, but my hope is for that. Um, and I would say, I think a lot of that is that nurture side, um, coming into play because that's been cultivated. Um, my parents worked very, very hard to cultivate that. And so that nurturing piece 
gave me the trust to be able to step out. Well, and in, in, in we may have some parents on here who are listening in. Um, one of the greatest gifts you can give your child is what Greg gave you, Emily, when he just said, um, I'm going to give you my blessing, but I'm, you always have a place to come home to. Mm-hmm. And that's that freedom, that blank check. I believe in you. I trust you. And at the end of the day, I will always love you. You can come back home was mm-hmm. a great gift he gave to you mm-hmm. and probably empowered you to make bigger decisions than even you were prepared for. So oh, yeah. let me ask you one quick question, because I know your journey. I know your parents. I know the background a little bit. At what age do you think you began disappointing, thinking differently, leaking different opinions, finding the, the guts to begin to differentiate from your family values? I would say early high school. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was some stuff that I began. Sneaking out at night. Oh, no. did I say that on the air? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I, they, they know that. That's why the alarm system was put in place. <laughs> um, we didn't need yeah. it for Abigail. No, my angel sister, she did not need it. But um, no, it was definitely high school. Um, that was when I was really in to dance and theater. So I was meeting all kinds of new people, diverse. Mm. Um, they were, you know, cultured. <laughs> they, they had uh, done things outside of Haywood County. And, you know, so I would say that was definitely it from... From me just forming my own opinions. What about you? Would you say maybe yours was even sooner than that? Mine was way later. Way later. Mine was an event happened in our family. Wow. That I just stopped caring. And mm. and 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 as we all do, you have a moment. You don't care anymore. Mm-hmm. You get through the moment, through the grief, through the frustration, and you care again, and then you come to a healthy balance. And so, you know, it's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. But I think one, because I had some abandonment issues, because uh, family dynamics, um, not having the right name, and and it just, I grew up in a childhood that um, was very unstable. That was probably the best word, unstable. And I'm a high producer. So I was a people pleaser and a high producer. And I wanted approval. I want mm-hmm. approval from my dad. I want approval from my mom. I want approval from other people. And so I went out to do the stuff and did as much as I could. But I was probably 40 years old before an event wow. happened that just, I just stopped. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. And which was a freeing moment for me looking at my journey in my life. And so um, I'm glad you asked because that's a hard conversation. It's a hard question, but it's very specific. And I was 40, bad situation. I stopped caring, started acting any way I wanted to act. And now I have the freedom to do that. Now I can say whatever I want to say. I can disagree about politics, about values or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And even right now. Um, you know, I have values today that I'm careful about how I talk about them because people have me in a box and I don't want to blow up the box because they can't handle me unless I fit within their box. And it's not that I've had something major. I mean, I tend to still see the world through a conservative lens. Um, and, uh, so that being said, I think that I'm still learning how to disappoint people for me to be me. Mm-hmm. Oh, and usually that's yeah. around what I can perform and just mm-hmm. say, nope, not going to show up and perform. It's not pursuing a life dream like we're talking about with our parents. Mm-hmm. So with that, you know, you really are such a hard worker, high producer. We've talked about that. How much of that do you think comes from those abandonment things like or is that, I mean, if you look at people in your family, like, oh, no, like, we're just, it's kind of like looking at my dad's side of the family, like, everyone is such hard workers. Like, they love work. They love hard work. And so I think some of that's like, oh, that's a nature thing in the CRISPR DNA. But then I also think, like, there's some nurture things where it's like, 
oh no, like I wanted to people please and make people proud of me. So that's also part of why I overperform or whatever. I would guess in my case, 75% was nurture. 75% was trying to earn my way, prove I was worthy, Mm -hmm. um, find a way at the table, blah, blah, blah. Um, not that my family's not hardworking or anything. That's that's never been a a trait I have ever evaluated, to be honest with you, because um, mm-hmm. there wasn't anything glaring, negative or whatever. But mm-hmm. I I know for me that seventy five or seventy five percent or greater is this um this obvious inadequacy in me trying to prove to me mm. that I have value and worth and. Obviously, at some point in my life, in since forty, I have come to some places where I don't, I don't need to produce anything else. I don't have any. If people don't know who I am, I don't even tell them. I just keep going about my business. But most of my life, it dictated the decisions I make, and that's what I'm trying to say. There are nature things. Mm-hmm. I, I, I saw something, um, a cool quote on Facebook, and it was a liquor bottle turned over, and the bottle was empty. And it said, liquor ran into my family until it ran into me. Mm. And I thought that was really cool that, you know, liquor was part of their generational curses, part of the generational makeup. And then it hit this person and this person, for whatever reason, had the grace to deal with it and beat it and will probably change the, the proclivity towards alcoholism in their family for the future generations because of that moment right there. And I believe that's a real thing, too. And let me say this, because you're bringing up something, and we only have a few minutes technically left, yep, so I might be a opening a can of, can of worms. So one really hard thing for me was um, when I got divorced, my dad, he, I mean, obviously my parents were very heartbroken to see what had happened. Um, but yeah. my dad, I know, was really wrestling with it because he's like, I I feel like I broke this generational thing because his parents got divorced. Yeah. And I know he really, he was like, I I thought I broke this generational thing off of our family. And, it, and I, I wrestled with that too because I was like, oh, dang, I let you, I let you down because you thought you'd conquered this thing. But what we have to keep in mind is, is that he broke that for his generation, like him and my mom. But it's also the work of the next generation to to either like deal with that or life happened, like things happen. And so for me, the way that I feel like I've overcome that, like, yes, divorce has happened to me, but I've not let that define who I am and stop me. So for me, I'm like, oh, no, well, I've broken that, too, because what could have been my detriment and my downfall and destroyed who I am, I now am stronger and more myself and more successful on the other side of that. So my look and my take on that is very different. And I know that was a sore spot when it came to this conversation of generational curses for our family. And and the way I would respond to that is. Um, I appreciate your dad trying to carry that responsibility, and he did his part. Uh, at the same time, you have a brother and a sister who are happily married, mm-hmm. and our plan- hope is is that they stay happily married the rest of their life. Yes. Um, you had a unique situation, and by the grace of God, you will find somebody, marry that person, and you'll enjoy a long, you know, long marriage the rest of your life, and he will look at that differently with time. Mm -hmm. With time, things will look differently than probably the vision he had at that moment because you're the Mm -hmm. oldest and and is very new and all that. The other thing I would just say is marriage is the hardest thing ever. It takes two people. Mm -hmm. And and if one person does 150%, it still doesn't guarantee success in the marriage because it takes two people doing 100%. And so I, I give a lot of passes when it comes to marriage because I know you can't do the other person's part. You mm-hmm. can't be as devoted to they. You can't raise your level of devotion to a level that causes them to be all in. They're all in or they're not all in. And so um, I, that's probably how I would respond. I agree with what you said, but the other side of the coin is he may have he may have done the necessary work. 
And it may start playing out, making it easier for you, your brother, your sister Mm -hmm. to have healthy marriages, but definitely doesn't guarantee it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's where that grace comes in, um, that we do the inner work for ourselves. Um, and we can't allow that burden to weigh us down. Like at the end of the day, like I speak for myself, you know, like I'm responsible for me. And so that was one thing I was like, I don't want my dad carrying that and like thinking like he, there was something he did to not, you know, to not be able to prevent that or protect me or whatever it could have been. Because at the end of the day, I'm an adult and um, I will be responsible for the decisions I make or the things that happen to me and how I respond to them. And, um. You know, I encourage people, especially with like different addictions that run in your family to really take ownership of breaking those things and like being very aware, especially when there's like already a health, you know, concern in place where, you know, like alcoholism is a disease and that's something that runs in my family. I'm going to take ownership of that and put boundaries down for myself. Um, But like I said, at the end of the day, like it comes back to the individual, like they me, I have to take responsibility. The last thing I would say is this, just like the gentleman I mentioned earlier, the five generations, he's carrying a family expectation, a generational Mm -hmm. expectation, a community's expectation. And he may be perfectly suited to check all those boxes. Great. I, 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 there are people created for that. Your father and your mother were created for small town America family values, lead the community, carry way more than you were ever supposed to carry for the benefit of the people and do it well. They're great. They did it well. You and neither one of your siblings will probably ever live in the same community again. You're too big for the community. You're going to be out somewhere else. And what you just said about, I love me more. I think the question that I would ask somebody who's, who's, who has sent us questions in is are you part of a long family line where you're called to uphold the family tradition and you have the grace to do it? Mm-hmm. If not, go be you. Yeah. Go be you and break away from that and realize that you're someone different and you're not supposed to be a replication of your mother or your father. You were birthed from your mother and father, nurtured by your mother and father, but have a DNA and a, a calling, a gift, a, a journey different than them. That's all I would say to that. Yes. Yes, yes, I agree. Absolutely. Woo! I we're we're technically over time, but there's a lot more we may we may have to circle back. We'll see what people say and then uh we may have to do a part 2 on this one cuz I'm sure there's well there was already plenty of people who were very interested in this topic. Um and now that we've done a full episode on it, I'm very curious to hear from you all. So, um, make sure you leave us a comment. Um, you can do that on YouTube, on any of our social media. Uh, send us an email. Let's process that podcast at gmail.com. We really are curious with feedback. Um, and again, we are out here processing in real time. We don't script, <laughs> especially these last few. Like, we're unhinged, people. We're unscripted. Here we are. Um, so thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, please go like, follow, subscribe, all the things. It really does mean a lot to us when you uh, do that on our pages. We appreciate every single one of you guys. And we hope you have a fantastic week. We'll see you next time.